Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for listening to our content and please like and subscribe. Back to Pure Athlete. Guys, I'll tell you what a great time we just had with uh, Reese Davis. Obviously, most people know him on College Game Day ESPN, but I love the insight he shared, starting on college football, but then great stuff with his son and daughter, daughter in theater, his son in, in baseball, and just how they kind of maneuvered um, their journey. Uh, just what a great dude. Yeah, I mean, we all we all know him as the guy talking college football or college basketball all the time, but to see him as the person, the dad, the husband, I mean, that whole side of him really came out, and it was it was really fun to watch and a lot of great stuff. I mean, he's he is a great um, commentator. He is he is one of the best in the business. But uh, in this interview, he comes across as even better dad. Yeah. So hope you enjoy the episode. Before we get to the podcast, if you have middle school or high school kids that play sports and you don't want to fundraise like me, we got you covered. My buddy Chris Carneal owns Booster. Chris? We help schools and sports teams raise funds in a super fun and engaging way. In fact, the last 22 years, we've raised $750 million, and we can't wait to help you. Choose Booster.com. Welcome back to Pure Athlete. I'm Jeff Francoeur, along with my two old guys here, Britt and Brad, again for a great episode. I'm excited about today. Uh, a guy that I watch every Saturday morning with my kids, uh, obviously the host of College Game Day, both football and college basketball. But more than that, he is the pride and joy of Muscle Shoals, Alabama, boys. So Reese Davis, welcome on. Glad to be with you guys. Thanks for inviting me, Jeff. I've, uh, I've been a fan of yours for a number of years, so and I, I'm sure uh, I'll be a fan of the guys after I see this podcast, but they're new to me, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I hear they're in my age demographic, uh, so I, that, we've got that going for us. Oh, gosh, man. That's <laughs> a, well, a lot of pressure there. I, yeah, I don't know if I can right. live up to being a fan, Reese Davis being a fan of ours. And well, we bef before we get going and talking about you sports and kind of the dynamic, I do want to ask you, though, you go from college football to college basketball. When do you get a break? When, when do you relax and go on vacation? After the NFL draft, uh, typically is the way it goes. Because once the final four is over, you look up, and, and I've already started some draft prep anyway because it's such a large undertaking that you can't wait until the last minute. But you are more immersed in basketball prior to that. But once you get to the final four and you look up and you go, oh, no, I've only got three weeks until the draft. So it it kind of keeps going. And then that that Saturday afternoon when uh, when you finish up with the third round and Mr. Irrelevant, when they've taken Brock Purdy and you know, then that you predict immediately he's going to be a star and lead his team to the Super Bowl, uh, tongue in cheek, obviously, um, then then that's when that's when you get a little bit of a break until the hardcore prep for college football starts again. Gosh, so May and June are probably your two sweet spots. Is that is that kind of it? Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. That, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Hard-working man. I, I'll tell you what, we can't wait to hear about your youth sports story, coaching your two kids uh, and the different things. But I, I would be reminiscent if I didn't ask you first question, just about the state of college athletics. I know you're very passionate about college sports. So are we. You know, I committed to go to Clemson. I'm a massive Clemson fan, but just where it is headed and is there any any of slowing it down and getting back to normal? I don't think it's ever going back, Jeff. I think what the what the goal is or should be anyway and hopefully is is to find a a structure that works for everybody and it's one that has to be collectively bargained. It's, I know that's sort of uh, an antithesis to what we all grew up with and what college sports was purported to be. But in my judgment, it's been a business for a really long time. And now it's just more of an above board business. And in order to give a little more sanity to it in terms of player movement, in terms of um, revenue distribution, I think the only answer to this is collective bargaining. Now, who do you bargain with? And who's doing the bargaining? That's those are the big questions. So is it is it something that comes under the jurisdiction of the NCAA? I personally do not think that's who will do the bargaining, especially in football. 
and who represents the players and actually has their best interest at heart. Because I hear a lot of people from time to time say, well, they should just tell them this is the structure. Well, you know what's going to happen then? Then somebody from on the player side, they're going to sue and they're going to win because they continually win these court cases. So I do think uh, I do think that eventually there will be revenue sharing. Uh, there will be some collective bargaining and the bargaining position that the players will have to give up is this unfettered free agency that they have right now. Now, they'll be compensated in some way for it, but I think that there will be more of a uh, more of a, a structure, more of an agreement, whether it's a financial penalty or whatever, if a guy decides to transfer to or from Clemson, which is, I know, an entirely different discussion. But, um, you know, I think I think that's where we are. And in the meantime, uh, the market is operating and the earth is not spinning off of its axis because, you know, players are making a lot of money. People are still enjoying college sports. It's a lot like going to the movies. I think you suspend a certain amount of disbelief and you want to think that everybody out there wearing the orange and purple with the paw and their headgear is there for the glory of good old Clemson. But you know, that's, that's not really the way it is on a, in a widespread case across college sports right now. It, has it always been, do you think Reese that, that has it always been like that? And we're just now seeing it come to fruition. I mean, because that was the concern that we talk about is, are you going to lose the, the, the fans who kind of believe in the old college you and believe in the, you know, the tradition and the bands and things like that. And so are you saying that it, that it really kind of has never been like we think it is, or it's, we're going to have to get used to the new reality. Both. I, I don't think, I mean, in the past now you couldn't move as easily. So it wasn't as apparent and it was also um, against the rules to pay the players, but they were getting paid. I mean, <laughs> they've been getting paid, maybe not quite like this, but they've been getting paid for a really, really long time. Um, I remember uh, one time being on, we had this 24 hour marathon uh, leading into the college football season one year. And when you've been up that long, and on TV that one, which is a completely unwise decision, by the way. <laughs> but it was when it was when Darren Darren McFadden was playing at Arkansas, and he had this uh, had this really uh, tricked out ride, uh, you know, which was fancy, and I don't know, maybe it had a hog snout on. It was, you know, it was really it was really something to behold. People were showing the pictures of it all over the place, and Desmond was on with me, and Desmond said. Um, Desmond said something to the effect that, you know, he drove a, a 71 Pinto or some such thing, you know, when he was at Ann Arbor. And I had, I worked in Michigan for about a year and a half, uh, right? Uh, well, the Fab Four, the Fab Five were still there. And without really employing the filter that I should have, I said, well, you should have gone to see the guy who handled the basketball players because they drove some really nice cars <laughs> when, uh, when I was there. And so it's been happening for, you know, for a long time. It's just a, it's just more overt now. It's more, um, I don't know if it's more structured or more organized. There was a pretty good, uh, it was a pretty good underground network that was a pretty, uh, pretty well oiled machine at a lot of places around college football. But it's, uh, it's more out there now with the collectives and all of those types of things. So, Reese, one final question on this topic. I mean, we, we all have interest in it as fans, but, you know, we're a youth sports podcast, high school sports. And, and everything that's going on does have an impact, you know, that trickles down to the next level. And, you know, we're already seeing D1 opportunities are being are in decline big time for high school athletes. Um, in, in addition to that, you know, we've got like 200,000 kids that are playing D1 sports today. And only about 20 percent of those are in revenue generating sports. So I know your son played baseball, and we're going to talk all about that. But there are a lot of folks that are concerned about sports going away in these non-revenue generating sports because more of the money is going uh, to players and coaches and facilities in those sports. What, what, what are your thoughts uh, about all of that? It's a tricky one. Because I still believe that for the most part, and there may be some exceptions to this, that the university's athletic departments will be able to fund any sport that they choose to fund. Um, it becomes a question of, like all of us, with our discretionary income, how do you want to spend it? And I, ultimately, there probably will be some uh, some opportunities and some sports that fall by the wayside unless unless this is somehow included 
uh, within the future structure whenever that comes about. But, you know, I think the point that you made about declining opportunities is a really interesting one because it's much like anything else in business and in our society, the people at um, at the top, the top achievers, whether you are the most talented singer or you're the most talented uh, chemist or whatever it may be, your opportunities don't really change that much because of your talent. It's the or the, the fact that you are at that moment in time standing out above the rest. It's the it's the young men and women who are still developing, who may have the potential to reach that, but have not yet uh, reached a point in their development where they are standing out above everyone else. And because there is such pressure to win at the upper echelon, rather than take a guy and and, and uh, Jeff's Clemson program is still standing probably as the primary notable exception to this, but rather than take a Hunter Renfro, you know, who was 135 pounds or whatever when Dabo took him at Clemson and then developed into a star at Clemson and a tremendous NFL player. The pressure to win right now is, is such that can I really afford in this program to take a guy who may take a couple of years, you know, before he's ready to contribute at a high level and Honesty compels you to say, might not. You know, sometimes guys develop and sometimes they don't. And, um, you know, so I think I think you're right in saying those opportunities uh, have changed because now players who might have started their careers and developed at Clemson, at, you know, at Auburn, at Alabama, at Georgia or whatever, are, are now pushed down a, a level or two. Maybe there's nothing wrong with that. And then they develop – there for a couple of years and if they do well then maybe then they get their opportunities to move up so it's a kind of mark DeRose is my neighbor and that's what he talks about a lot of time he was a 22nd round pick and now there's only 20 drafts or 20 rounds in the mlb draft he's like there's plenty of guys that never would have had an opportunity possibly so yeah i do i do think it's interesting like you said like the hunter renfros are they going to exist as much probably not mm -hmm. or they could work their way up if they get d2 it, first and like a farm system Yep. Right. If they if they do a lot of times, Jeff, you know, maybe not every time, but more often than not, then maybe they start at a Mac school. Maybe they start at, you know, a Mountain West school or something like that. And then if they and then you, there are still some things that are a little bit beyond their control. If you are a receiver, for instance, and you start at a Mac school, well, maybe, you know, maybe you have maybe that school has quarterback issues and you uh, you don't get a chance to be as productive as your talent might dictate. So it, it creates a lot of uh, a lot of challenges for sure for guys who aren't the four and five stars. The four and five stars are going to be fine. It's uh, it's the ones that are just below that that will still be fine. It's still great to get an opportunity at a Mac school or at a Sun Belt school. I don't mean to cast aspersions to that. That's fantastic. I mean, um, but you know, if they aspire to play at the upper echelon of of college football or college basketball, um, not quite being a finished product uh, when you finish high school makes it a little more difficult. Hey, trust me. I love the Maction in November. I tune in every Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday night, Tuesday maybe for night, other man. reasons, maybe for other reasons too, but I definitely am tuning in. <laughs> uh, are, are, are you, are you a man who enjoys a game of chance? I <laughs> love Maction. My, my wife actually hates November. My wife hates November. Cause she's like, it's, I used to only get Tuesday and Wednesday for Netflix with you. Now you're watching football seven nights a week. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but well, thanks for that. And that, so let's, let's flip the script a little bit. You grew up in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Um, give us your bet. Give us your best U sports memory. Oh man. I mean, there, there aren't that, there aren't that many of them. I don't think I wasn't, you know, it wasn't that great. I think, um, uh, you know, I played all three sports growing up. I was, uh, was better at, at, football and basketball, which is not saying much. That's a pretty low bar uh, that I that that I'm putting there. But, uh, you know, I I don't know. Probably the best memory I have actually was before we moved to Muscle Shoals. We had a uh, I lived in a small town called Hamilton and we had uh, we had a, a peewee football team that was actually really good. And, you know, we, back then in small towns, you traveled around other towns and played, you know, at, at a at 10 years old and I was not the greatest athlete in the world, but I could throw it. 
So I played fullback because I would block a little bit, but I threw it better than the quarterback. So our our go to play was uh, something that was very complicatedly named. It was called fullback pass to the right end, going straight down the field. <laughs> so uh, so we, uh, you know, throwing touchdown, throwing touchdown passes and stuff like that was probably uh, probably the highlight. And as far as as far as high school, I was a decidedly below average uh, football and basketball player. And you know, there not a, not a lot to write home about in those, but I did I did love it and enjoyed playing. When did you um, when did you start realizing that kind of journalism was in your future? When, what what uh, what kind of ignited that passion? You know, I think when when I was a kid and I was playing all the sports, but after I you know on Saturday nights I would I would be in my bedroom with the radio trying to you know this is show this once again shows a different demographic than Jeff is uh, familiar with in terms of age, but you know games weren't on all night on Saturday night. So you had to listen on the radio. So I would try to, you know, listen to the LSU game. LSU, or yeah. The Ole Miss game. Or, yeah, or whatever, you know, whatever you could get on the clear channels. And sometimes KMOX from St. Louis would come in and maybe they would have, you know, a Cardinals game on in the summer. And I, I was listening to all of those games growing up and watching everything I could. And, you know, I just, I, I just knew I wanted to do it, but I didn't know anything about it. I mean, this was, you know, completely... Uh, foreign territory to my parents you know they didn't you know they weren't familiar with anything like that I mean they were sports fans but in terms of pursuing broadcasting as a career but you know my mom was always just uh, very diligent in telling me to you know pursue whatever I uh, pursue my dream you know to to go try and go try to do it if you want to achieve something big then go you know there was no harm in, in giving it your best shot. So I, I think I was always fascinated not only by playing the games themselves, but by the descriptions of them, the pictures that came from them. And, I, you know, just from from the time I was, you know, five or six years old, I was completely uh, enthralled by the games. We before we moved around a lot before we moved to Muscle Shoals and the my first football season that I remember is 1971 and I lived in a small town in Alabama called Guin and the high school football team there started the first of a three-year run in which they won the state championship every year and lost one game three years and those you know were my early formative sports memories and just the whole town um, shutting down to go across the state for a playoff game I mean everybody went and you know so it was I, I think just just that feeling of excitement that I think sports pulls people together in a way that nobody else can. Certainly I didn't recognize that as a second grader. It was just fun, uh, you know, then, but I think that you sort of get mesmerized by it in the early, in the early going and it sort of sparked my passion for it. What was the dynamic with your mom and dad? Like, I mean, were they more supportive? Did they push you a little bit, a little bit of both? Um, I would say more supportive than pushing. Um, my, you know, my dad was, my dad was a machinist and he would always, you know, they were always supportive. They were always at the games. Um, you know, they always, you know, believed in me and my dad would always, it, the extent of my dad's advice to me, like when I would go to a high school football game is like, before I could drive, he would drop me off, you know, and he would, uh, last thing before I got out of the car, he would just look at me and say, stay cool. You know, that, that was it. It was like, you know, basically his way of saying, don't get too, you know, don't get too wound up, you know, about it. it you know, it's, it's just a game. Stay cool. And, you know, that was kind of it. And whether the game went well or didn't go well or whether I played a lot or didn't play at all, uh, they were always uh, they were always very, you know, very supportive in, in that aspect. So, so Reese, you know, we we love you sports here and and. And even with all the issues in youth sports today, we promote it a lot because we think there's just great value. And and you're among the 95% that didn't play, you know, in college, played youth sports, but didn't play in college. So most kids don't, uh, but they still gain a lot from their youth sports experience. As you look back, you know, what what did you get out of playing youth sports in, in addition to fun? I think fe- – yeah, I think the feeling of teamwork, the the feeling of, you know, sometimes things are hard and also learning to react when things don't go your way. You know, I was I was pretty sure, you know, that I was going to be, you know, the star guard and a star quarterback of my high school team. And uh, and I wasn't. 
I you know broke my collarbone as a sophomore. I you know had a shoulder injury uh, my junior year of football didn't work out. Um, I played some, but not a lot as a junior in high school on the basketball team. And as a senior, I was a starter, but you know, I, I didn't put up these awesome numbers and, you know, didn't dominate games the way I thought I was going to, because I was, you know, I, I wasn't good enough, you know? So I think that you learn things like how you envision things. Sometimes things in life don't go the way you envision them. And when they do, it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. You might not realize it at the time, but how are you going to pick yourself up? How are you going to use that to say, okay, you know what? Um, I always felt like I worked hard as an athlete, but I probably didn't work smart because I didn't know, you know, it was the eighties. It, it was sort of different. So I, I sort of, I sort of figured out then, okay, if you didn't achieve the things that you thought you might when you were seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And, you know, you all of a sudden your high school career is over and it didn't work out the way you thought it was going to, you know, well, that's okay because you still made, still made your uh, relationships and you learned a lot about how to handle d disappointment and adversity. You know, I look, uh, you know, we had in, in football, there were three, three head coaches uh, during my time in high school, um, you know, we had, I think, a one-win season, two-win season. Um, we did have a really good basketball team my junior year and a solid win my senior year. But, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't go to the state tournament. We, you know, we didn't, we didn't cut down a bunch of nets and, you know, all of those types of things. It didn't, you know, you didn't have all this glory that you envision when you, when you start playing sports and, you know, you've been watching Super Bowls and NCAA tournaments and NBA finals and things like that. And you think, well, that's what we're going to do on our level. We're going to win the championship. And so when you don't, or when you, you know, when you don't score 20 points a game, when you don't, you know, throw 30 touchdown passes or something, then you realize, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the end of the world. And I think that learning to work through some of that stuff from a mental standpoint and from, uh, you know, a, a team individually and then working together with your teammates, I think is, is very valuable in any walk of life later. And it also fosters the desire to have a great sense of team. And that's what I feel like, I hope anyway, that people I've worked with over the years, uh, whether it's, you know, in the studio with uh, Mark May and Lou Holtz or in my um, college game day, football and basketball roles, I hope that, that my teammates look at me as being a good leader who cares about the good of the whole and the team. And I think a lot of those things can be traced back to, you know, to playing youth sports, whether it's high school or even before that. Well, if you can impress Pollock, which you, you did, then you did it right. Cause that's, that's a tough <laughs> job in itself. <laughs> um, you know, I guess that's, that's a great point, Reese, that we talk as parents, we're always telling our kids, um, you know, be a good teammate. You know, that's more important than anything else. Uh, because it's the right thing to do. It, it's a it's thing it's it's a thing that shows character, regardless if you're starting, if you're doing well, if you're in a slump. But but just your example there is like you took that um, that theme of of being a great teammate, and you've you parlayed it into a great career. And you can see that you can see that with when you're on game day that you guys just have such a great chemistry. And so that's it's really a great thing for our audience to to hear from you is that man taking something that that is yeah it sounds great it's kind of a cliche be a great teammate, but it actually helps you in life. Yeah, and he's he's quarterbacking now every yeah. every Saturday. Well, and and I he is, but I, I'll say this, and, you know. and and a lot of and a lot of times I'll tell you this, I get hit right in the back of the head <laughs> sometimes too. <laughs> you take the hard hits, no doubt. But you know, you think about it too, and I and you know when I always tell people too, not just being a good teammate, but when you elevate other people's games too, right? It just helps the team. I mean, that's it's like when we when I, I love golf, when I play golf with better golfers, man, it brings my game out, right? If I play with these two guys, <laughs> we I'm bring them down. Mid nineties, <laughs> you know, but on a good day, <laughs> you know. So fast forward a couple years later, you you get married and y'all have two kids of your own, a son and a daughter, mm -hmm. and so. As they were growing up, and and you know, I actually kind of curious about this because I do travel some with my job too. How did how did you navigate being there for them, being at work? I mean, were there a lot of sleepless nights? I'm guessing uh, there were, Jeff. And I think you know, I tried, 
I tried to, when I was there, I tried to be there. Yeah. Um, I think there are examples that you can set for your kids. It's wonderful if someone has a job that allows them to be at every practice and every game. That's fantastic. But I think there's also a great example that can be set if you have a job that will not allow you to do that, that you, that you do what you're supposed to do that you not only fulfill your obligation, but you do it enthusiastically, that you're enthusiastic about your job. Your kids see that. And I, I think it's, I think that can be um, almost as impactful as being there. Being there is really important. But when I was there, which I was a lot, and I was fortunate to be able to be there a lot, um, make sure you're present, that your mind's not on the job, that you're not now in this day and age constantly looking at your phone, constantly checking your email. Be there. Uh, the emails will still be there on the other side. I realize there are circumstances from time to time that require that yeah. you be alert and ready for the job, even if you're at practice. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about as a general rule, when you're with your kids, be with your kids. When you're with your wife, be with your wife. And that's what I tried to do. I'm sure I didn't always do it, uh, do it successfully, but that was, that was why I tried. I was on, on podcast last week with, uh, uh, with an aspiring broadcaster who uh, is a superstar track athlete at Auburn, uh, Justin Stuckey. And Justin really did his homework. Um, he was like three-time All-American at Sanford and transferred, finished his career at Auburn. And um, he did his homework, and he he reached out and got in touch with my daughter. And she said that she didn't recall me missing anything mm. of hers. Now, she right. wasn't an athlete. She played some field hockey, mostly because she knew I knew nothing about field <laughs> hockey and therefore I couldn't go in and medal. But she was primarily in musical theater. She said, I don't remember him missing anything. I do. I distinctly remember times when she had events as a kid that I had to be away for game day or I, you know, I had an assignment. And I think what I took from that was that hopefully I succeeded more often than I failed that when I was there, I was there and it made an impact on her that these things that still haunt me, you know, that I missed, you know, 15, 20 years ago or whatever it was that, um, you know, that still bother me. Fortunately, they don't bother her because when I was there, I, I tried to be there. So so she did theater and your son, Chris, what were what were his kind of passions growing up and, and what kind of coach or father were you to him? Um, <laughs> uh, he, he, he played them all. He played, he played football, uh, basketball and baseball, but baseball for whatever reason was what he gravitated to from about the time he could walk. We, the house we were living in at the time, uh, when he was, you know, like two, two or three years old, um, we had this big great room, which was great for playing. And we had this little, actually it was a little Braves hacky sack. And I would, I would stand back and he would take his his fist like this not even a bat didn't, couldn't have a bat in the house you know but he would take his hands and i would just throw him this little hacky sack and he would whack it and then you know run around the bases and every you know virtually every hit was a home run and you know so he he was drawn to baseball i think more than than the others from an early age but he played football and basketball too uh into high school and so it was um, it, it was a lot of fun. And I coached his teams, you know, either assistant coach or whatever. And um, we we actually when he was on the 10U team in our little tiny town of Burlington, uh, we we won the 10U state championship and still one of the one of the great nights of my life to show you my great motivational powers. I um, I decided that when we started the all stars and we started the tournament and stuff, I got this old paint can and um <laughs> And and I wrote can of whooping on it, not <laughs> whoop backside, just whooping. You know, you gotta, you gotta you know, keep it PG <laughs> for the ten year olds. Yeah, keep it PG for the ten year olds. And we called it the can of whooping. And we took it with us everywhere we went. And I went by the Cumberland Farms, which I don't know if you guys if we have those in the South, but in New England it's a convenience store. And I would get this uh blue because our colors were blue, and I would get this blue slushy mix. And I would put it in there, but I wouldn't tell the kids what the what the stuff was. And we'd go out in the corner for our meeting before the game. You know, hey, everybody get ready, whatever's starting. And we would we would pour a little bit of the can of whooping out on the field because we were going to apply it to our opponents' backsides. That's what we'd say. And they'd all <laughs> yell and holler and everything. And and it worked. And then I did I didn't tell them for a few years until they moved on 
up the ranks a little bit about what was actually in there. But, uh, but it, I mean, it was a, it was a great experience. I coached him um, until he got on the big field. And when he got on the big field, I said, you need somebody who knows more about this game than I do uh, to coach you. So I'm just going to be dad and just watch, you know, from, from this point forward. But I always, um, I through batting practice. I still go with him now. I'm a terrible batting. Pra- I'm, I'm so wild. I am wild throwing <laughs> batting practice. If I can get, if I can get in a groove, it's okay, but man, I'm terrible at it, but I still do it. And it's a time that I, that I still really enjoy, but the, it, it was, it, it was fun, man. I still have all of these mementos from that 10U championship team and, you know, I have, I have a bat signed by all the kids, got pictures up. You know, it was a, it was a lot of fun. We won and came back to town. They greeted us with fire truck, the fire truck <laughs> sirens Jeez. blasting and everything. So we, uh, we, we had a, we had a really good time with it. I coach my daughter's 10 year travel team, and I think I'm going to have to get a can of whooping for this weekend. It's our first you tournament. You may have to pay, you may have to pay Reese for the rights I, to I use might, that. I might you know, did you get the rights to can all of whooping? Yours, Cause man. a lot of, a lot of great yours, coaches will probably yours. want to use that, you know? To oh. the- so, so Reese, we, we talk a, a lot about travel sports and, you know, and all the issues and specialization and all those types of things. And, and your son is, your son is still young. I mean, he's in his early twenties, I think, and uh, and so you're not that far removed from from all of that. But but Chris achieved a lot. Uh, tell tell our audience, you know, what level he he's gotten to. He's still playing, and uh, and then we want to ask you some questions and ask your opinions on on things because a lot of a lot of a lot of current parents look at like Brad and I and our opinions and say, and even Jeff, you know, they say, oh, it was a different era twenty years ago. Uh, you've just lived, you know, this era. So tell, tell us a little bit about Chris and, and where he is now. Well, he just signed with the Evansville Otters in the Frontier League. He played with the Birmingham Bloomfield Beavers in the United Shore Professional League last year. And he played at, um, at Princeton and Duke um, as a, you know, as a college player and, you know, endured myriad injuries at Princeton as actually – some at Duke in his final year as well. But, you know, sort of what Jeff uh, was talking about, what you guys were talking about, about being a good leader, probably as proud as I am of him as a player. Uh, he was a two-time captain at Princeton and was a captain his last year at Duke. And these were all elected by his teammates. They weren't, you know, where the coach said, okay, you're going to be captain, you're going to be captain. Uh, so three times in his college career, he was elected captain by his teammates. So, you know, I, I'm really, really proud of that. But I did ask him, I told him, you know, the Jeff, you'd asked me to be on uh, your podcast. And I said, and they're going to talk about you sports. I said, so tell me where I screwed up. I said, so tell me where you think I screwed up. And, you know, he said something interesting. He said, um, he said, I don't think you screwed up at all. He goes, but if I, he said, if I ever coach my son, he said, in the lower levels, he said, my number one goal, and I always hoped this would be the goal, he said, would be that at the end of the season, I want to play baseball next year. He said, so I would, he, he said, we get so caught up, or he said, you guys did, and, you know, the baseball and trying to win. He said, I would probably fall more. And look, you, gotta, you guys are baseball guys. So, you know, he's, he is a long time devotee. He's not only trained with driveline, he's worked with them, but he is a believer in that mentality. He said, so there would be a lot of, as a kid, how far can you throw this ball? How far do you think you can hit it? He said, because he thinks that would, that would be fun. And he said, and at that stage, he feels like that helps, uh, helps them develop their skills as much as anything. So he would, you know, try to make it fun. So he's, um, he's always loved it. He's always been driven. He's a very serious guy. Um, you know, he's, uh, I mean, he's got a great sense of humor. I don't, I don't mean that, but he's, he's hardcore, you know, he's, he's up in the morning and, uh, and the raw eggs go in and drink and he's like in the weight room and setting, you know, setting PRs and hitting and, and all of that stuff, you know, like, you know, at this stage of the of off season every day. So he's pretty hardcore and we're, you know, we've been very supportive of that as best we can be because it means so much to him. And, you know, I think that's been, that's been the biggest thing. I love, I love that advice. You know, I, I, tell them all the time like my saying is coach them hard love them hard and hope they sign back up mm-hmm. next year and like yeah, especially yeah. I think like Chris said at the young age so when he as he got older 15 16 17 did he obviously play travel ball and all that stuff it, it, we had we were a um 
we were a year behind on everything, it seemed, in terms of figuring all of that out because it was a new world for me and he was, you know, that age. So he he went to a one of those showcase things, you know, and you, he didn't need to do it at that age, but we didn't know he didn't need to do it. You know, so somebody saw him there and asked him to play on, on one of these teams. It was an outfit called MVP. So that was our first exposure to um to travel ball or, or that level of travel ball where that he went with a team and they went down to Atlanta and played you know in the WWBA thing and then later on a guy he was uh, training with as his hitting coach just a tremendous guy who played uh played for a long time in the minor leagues played in the big leagues a little bit I don't, Jeff I don't know if you know Ryan Redmanovich but um uh Ryan you know Ryan played for the Mariners for a while and um just a tremendous guy. And he said, Hey, I've got this, um, I've got this contact with the East Cobb Astros. And so he went down and played for them for a couple of years. So we experienced uh, from the local Connecticut travel ball, which, you know, is, I think is fine for developing, but doesn't kind of get you out there all the way to, and I, I'm not sure how travel ball stands now, but at that time playing with the East Cobb Astros pretty good was, you know, it was a, <laughs> yeah, it was a big deal. I mean, he, on his team, the first year he went down there uh, was Carter Keyboom, yep. and, uh, Will, Will Benson yep. and Braxton Garrett and Reggie Pruitt, you know, a lot of, a lot of tremendous, I think everybody on that team uh, ended up playing if they didn't go straight uh, to the pros they ended up playing, you know, at a, at a power five. Yeah. I think every, every single person on that team, which is, you know, sort of a different world than playing in the, uh, uh, you know, Kiwanis League in Connecticut where you're traveling <laughs> around the state, you know, but it was – so it was a good experience for us. I know that people have horror stories about it, but, um, but you know, I think overall the travel ball experience was a positive one for us. I mean, you had to – you have to find the right spot because there's certainly – politics and different things involved but you've got to not get overly concerned with all of that and just find the right spot for your son so that he'll first enjoy the game can develop and hopefully you know get the eyes on him uh, that he needs to and I, without I think being taken didn't... advantage of because you know you're not I, i'd be lying if i said there aren't outfits out there that just take your money and then you're on some far-flung field and you're just playing and, you know, so you have to be wise about uh, who you affiliate yourself with. And I think y'all did a good job because at that point, right, you're 15, 16, 17. For Chris, he understood what was at stake, right? Like he wanted mm -hmm. to play at the next level, you know, and that's right. what we preach a lot of here on time is I love what he said when I'm younger, make it fun. How hard can you hit? How mm -hmm. hard can you throw? And then eventually, mm -hmm. right, you're going to have that opportunity, whether it's, softball basketball whatever theater with your daughter soccer it doesn't matter like yeah. you when you get to high school you know what's at stake at that point so i think that's a great kind of road y'all took uh, we try you know i i was gonna i was gonna tell this story and I'm, hopefully i won't tear rotator cuff patting myself on the back but we had a we had a fall ball team i think it was a 12u fall ball team as i recall and we had uh, we had these these two twins who had never really played baseball before. And, and they, they came in and I mean, you know, there were rules in the league about how much they had to play with that. I mean, they had a hard time playing catch. I mean, it was to the point where the dad came to us at one point and said, well, I'd like for, you know, like for my son to play, you know, first base, play some infield. And I said, I understand. I said, but I said, I'm, he, I'm afraid he's going to get hurt. I said, this, this group, I said, I'm not trying to say they're all superstars, but I said, these guys have all played together. And they're, I said, they, I said, let's, let's just be patient here and, you know, do it. And he took it very well. And so the twins would always play catch with each other because playing catch was a chore at that time for them. And um, one of them, they had a family, had some type of um, commitment one Sunday. So they, uh, we were playing a game on Sunday afternoon and they call and say, you know, well, they can't be there. I'm like, understand, no problem. Well, one of them showed up. One of the twins still wanted to come and wanted to come to the game. And he came to the game and whatever. And afterwards, we, we, um, we gave him the game ball for just, 
you know, the team was important to him. He wanted to play. So we gave him the game ball and, and his mom and dad had told me a couple of times later how much it meant to him and sort of lost contact. And they went to a different private school and, and my son played for Avon Old Farms, which was sort of the, you know, the baseball powerhouse of the area. And we go over to play Kingswood, Oxford one day and his mom walks up to me and I said, oh, hey, it's great to see you. And her son was the starting, ca- the kid who couldn't play catch was a starting catcher on the opposing team. And she said, one of the reasons he kept playing was you guys gave him the game ball and he, you know, he hardly did anything just for being dedicated to it. And, you know, I think that's something for parents to think about as they, you know, as they are involved, not only with their own kids, but the other ones, some of them need a little encouragement and some of them, you know, you need to find their victories, you know, at that stage. Now he turned out to be, this kid actually turned out to be a good high school player. And uh, so there are a couple of lessons there. One at 12, Okay, you can't you don't know that he's not going to be good just because he, you know, is learning the game and doesn't really know anything yet. That's one thing. And the other thing is you find the victories for for the kids in your in your program or on your team, you know, to give them opportunity to feel success, uh, you know, whatever that might look like for them. Wow. That's awesome advice. That, that, yeah, I think fantastic. about it, what you're talking about. Pollock, when he came on with us, it's still one of my favorite things. We've had over, what, 60 guests. He said, until your kid goes through puberty, you really do not know yep. what you're working with. And it's so true. Right. I think yeah. back to high school, right? And we say, guys on my fourth and fifth grade football team that were really good, ninth and tenth grade, they didn't even play, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's I mean, you can even think back to guys that that we grew up playing with. I mean, um, there there was a guy that that I played with growing up in youth sports and he he dominated all the time. He was the biggest, strongest, toughest. And he did have some extenuating circumstances. I still think he could have been a great high school player, but uh, he he ended up not even playing in at all in high school. He wasn't you know, wasn't even on the team or part of it. And at, at that time, if you had seen him at 10 or 11, you would have said, well, he's going to the SEC, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, you know, it just, you know, it, things change because he actually was more developed physically than everyone else who was his age. So Reese, I want to ask you as, as a youth sports parent, you know, I, as the further away I get from my journey as a parent, the more I remember all the great stuff and I let go of the challenging things, just kind of a, a human thing. But as you look back, you know, what was really challenging for you and your wife in the whole youth sports journey, if you if you remember anything and, and how you navigated that? I don't know that this is the best thing to share because you want to put it in the in the best light possible. I was my experience coaching was sort of unlike a lot of the others. I honestly, maybe it was the town we lived in, maybe it was the parents on the team. I don't have any parent horror stories. I really don't. Um, you know, I One time, a guy who was actually a friend of mine just in a a town league game got upset with uh, the guy I was the assistant coach for and I about some lineup things one time. And then he, like, later that evening apologized profusely. I don't have any parent horror stories. I think the thing I look at that was a challenge for us was maintaining the balance of what it was okay for him to miss. And I think we probably erred on that side when he was younger is okay to miss some things. He doesn't have to play in every league. He doesn't have to play on every team in every sport, Um, you know, because you get caught up as a parent. Well, he likes it. You know, it, it's something that is productive. There's nothing wrong with it inherently, but where do you, I I know Pollock does a great job of this, of, of putting out there. Don't, don't let him miss church. Don't let him miss church for a sporting event, you know, and not that we did that that much, but we would alter the service we went to and different things like that. Maybe you don't do that. Uh, you know, maybe you establish that that's the priority or what, whatever other family priority you might have that, especially at a really young age, that that comes first and the other can fall in line behind it. And I think the other challenge we had was, the feeling of anxiety that once you get to a certain level where you do need someone to notice you, if you want to continue your career in college or whatever it might be, um, you know, getting someone to notice your, uh, notice your son and is he getting the proper attention and keeping that in perspective is, uh, 
you know, is a challenge. I, something that happened um, when he was playing for the uh, Astros, East Cobb, after he had, he was young for the age groups he was playing on. So he was playing the year after he graduated from high school just to be sharp and try to get ready for his first college season. And he had had a really good game and uh, a scout from the Indians came up to him after the game and thinking he was still in high school. And he said, no, I graduated and I'm going, going to Princeton. And he goes, well, what happened with the draft? He goes, nobody ever talked to me about the draft. And the guy said, nobody ever. He goes, look, I'll, I'll come see you all this stuff. The next day, the next morning, we're playing in a, um, in a game, driving rainstorm out at uh, Lake Point, right? Lake Isn't Point, that the facility yep. north of Atlanta? Yeah. He's having another great game. You know, he's feeling he's kind of on top of the world because finally, just so it wasn't the result of digging in and emailing coaches and sending video and all that. Somebody just saw him play, you know, and came and said the next morning, he had a couple of hits early in the game. He got a hit, stole second and took off for third, slid feet first into third. Still don't know exactly how this happened. He dislocated his shoulder and it ended up later on, long story short, um, you know, required surgery, cost him what was supposed to be his freshman year, all of this stuff. But as I look back on that, you know, there was so much anxiety about getting recognition, who's seeing him, are the right people seeing him at the right time? Is he going to get the opportunities he's worked for? And then it happens. And then the very next day, it shows you how fragile it is. You know, then it instead embarks on this uh, long rehabilitation process and surgery and all of that kind of stuff. So it I think that that's something that I would encourage parents is try not to have the anxiety about the recognition, not in terms of accolades, but in terms of opportunities. Try not to have that anxiety about it. It'll, you know, as long as you put him in position, the right ones, generally speaking, you have to be aggressive and you should be, but generally speaking, the right ones will come along and try to ratchet down the anxiety because a lot of different things can happen in sports. I, tell you, I, I know. I think I know the answer to this question, but uh, you know, what's what's a crazier world? The world of youth sports, or the world of musical theater for uh, it, it, for youth. <laughs> I would say I would say it's probably youth sports. Although my daughter might might differ a little bit. Um, she she kind of uh, I don't want to say kept herself, but she sort of stayed stayed in the lane locally and she would go to New York every summer and, and work in, in this program called the Broadway workshop. And so she would do those things. I never really experienced a ton of craziness there. Now you would see the, the crazy backstage parents and so forth. But, you know, I, I was, I was enough, uh, I was enough of just being in the, in the theater, applauding the performance, uh, running lines with her and stuff like that, that I was sort of, I think we were both, both my wife and I were a little bit removed from, from that aspect of it. And she, you know, and she was content to pursue it the way she did and is now, you know, pursuing it on her own in, in New York. Uh, after after getting out of NYU, so she she's now experiencing a little bit of the real world craziness, I think, as opposed to what we saw back then. But certainly there were some there were some parents who who felt certain that their you know ten uh, year old was was destined to star on Broadway for decades, and and maybe they will be. I hope they will be. You should aspire big, but it was uh, it was not we were not quite as immersed in that aspect of of the theater um, as we were in the sports angle. My, my wife and I took our two oldest the other night to see Hamilton at the Fox down in Atlanta, and it was incredible. But we walked out, and my daughter said, I want to do that. And I'm like, sweetie, you got my singing ability. <laughs> you ain't doing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a t- it's a tougher uh, – I think it's a tougher road than, uh, than oh, sports. God, yeah. my, my daughter actually uh, did that same program uh, up in New York, and she's actually flying to New York tonight to move to New York City to uh, – you know, to, to, to take a shot at it. So, uh, yeah, we, we get it. We get it. Well, we ought to admit, we ought to, after this is over, we'll make sure they can, they can connect. You know, it's like, uh, um, my daughter had an audition recently that she, that she felt like she crushed and, you know, I guess she came in runner up, you know, for, for the part and, you know, it happens and it's sort of, you know, it's a lot like in some ways, the one thing I've been able to relate to with her is that, you know, I tell her, that in in television sometimes 
they're looking for something specific. And whether you are the best broadcaster is a little bit irrelevant. Whether you may technically be the best actor, technically you've uh, you've nailed the audition. Maybe there, you know, there's a there's a different look. There's a you know, uh, maybe maybe they wanted somebody taller than you. Maybe somebody shorter than you. Maybe you know, whatever it might be. Uh, there's some things you can't control, so you just have to you have to kind of kind of let it go. So I, I mean, I was told one time in broadcasting for I'm really glad I didn't get the job because I ended up getting the job at ESPN later. That um, uh, I was told once, you know, you didn't get the job. You were the best in the audition, but there were you know some. Uh, we, you, you don't fit what we, what we need right now. And, you know, you just have to move on with that. That's sort of the way it is in acting too, I think. I, I know this. I, I remember going back and listening to the first game I broadcast about six years ago. And I remember thinking, how did they not fire me on the spot, man? God, it was brutal. <laughs> so bad. So, so Ray, speaking of broadcasting, I got to ask you, you know, your interview of, of Saban, you know, right after the announcement was, was tremendous. It was just really a great interview. Now he's coming on your show. Uh, how are you going to keep all those personalities? I mean, I'm sure you're super excited to have him on the show and what he brings to the show. But man, what a what a bunch of personalities! And how do how do you get everybody to have airtime? You're gonna have the toughest <laughs> job this year, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, I, I do think that he's going to bring a layer to the show that um, that will be, you know, will be something that we haven't seen. Someone who's coached that recently uh, to be to be part of it too is going to give us some real insight in a lot of different ways. He's a gifted communicator, as you guys know. But I think the best thing about the group as a whole is what we touched on earlier. Everybody want, everybody cares about the good of the show. Now, look, all of us who are in television, present company included for sure, you know, we, we have our egos. We have the things that we want to get out there. We have ways that we think things should be done. And, you know, I think that probably – generally speaking, helps you overall because you should want to be the best you can be. But you also have to recognize um, where you sacrifice a little bit, where you might allow a teammate to shine a little bit, knowing the area of, of expertise of each person there who might be stronger on a certain topic. And the good thing about all of those guys is that they really understand team. And I as gifted and as brilliant as Pat McAfee is a force of nature, probably, um, you know, along with Charles Barkley right now, the most dynamic and uh, impactful uh, broadcasters. And, and Pat's even different because he does his own show, you know, every day. Pat is in a position where it's not incumbent on him to be a good teammate, but he is. He's a, he's a tremendous teammate. And, you know, because of that, I think, uh, with the experience that uh, Kirk and Desmond and, you know, Kirk's the backbone of the show. He's been there 26, 27 years, whatever it is. Um, you know, I think all of those things and the desire to make the show as good as it can be is, uh, is something that will make my job a little bit easier than it might seem on the surface. Although I, I'm sure there will be, there will be moments of challenges. I'm sure. Oh man. Well, I know we're excited, man. It's going to be a lot of fun and, Finishing up with you, I'm going to give you five uh, quick, just fire away questions at you. What's your favorite college campus for game day, for football? Okay, you have to you have to take your alma mater out of the mix, right? But favorite one of all time is uh, Washington State uh, because of the crusade that they were to go on. But the perennial place that um, that we love to go, I think it, we always get a. A, a great reception. It's great to go to LSU. So, yeah, that's a great. What about for basketball? What's your favorite for basketball? That one's easy, and I'm not going to dance around. The best place is Allen Fieldhouse at Kansas. If I could only see one more college basketball game, I would go there. And I know, I know, my son has degrees from Duke, and I love Cameron, and it's awesome, and it is like one A behind. Allen Fieldhouse. Yeah, Billis, Billis. That's Hands what Billis down. said. Jay, yeah. Hands down, number one. Jay Billis was on with us last year, and he told us the exact same thing. Yep. And it's did like, he really? He yeah. did. He did. It's uh, it 
It is if you haven't been and if you like college basketball, you should go. Yeah, it's it's just a really, really cool place to see a game. Uh if you could interview one person in sports you haven't interviewed, who would it be? Ooh, that's a that's a great question. One person that I haven't interviewed in sports and kind of mm, you know what? I would say I'm gonna say Michael Jordan. Uh, because yeah. because he's a little he's a little bit reclusive uh, maybe reclusive is too strong but private and and I think that you know and you've seen a lot of him in a lot of different ways but I, I think maybe maybe somebody maybe somebody like that that would be cool you think about it the last dance was what ten episodes and you still feel like you don't really know him yeah and that was you know a, yeah yeah I agree I'd like to see that interview yeah. exactly what about a sport who's the sports broadcaster you looked up to growing up uh Keith Jackson Bob Costas uh someone once told me that Bob Costas was prepared for life so I, I thought you know in terms of a wide uh, uh wide preparation in terms of knowledge or at least awareness so those are a couple the the one in terms of um you know in terms of guys I, w- I worked with, probably I think Dan Patrick is still a textbook in terms of how to host a show and how to host Sports Center, particularly. So those those are guys for sure that I looked up to. And I know I'm giving you a bunch of answers, but Keith Olbermann is the greatest writer ever in in the history of of Sports Center. So he was he was a guy I admired his work as well. You know, I get a chance to do five or six games with Bob every year with TBS for baseball. And the first time we did a game together, it was pretty cool. And we get done doing the game. And we went, I think, and had like a glass of wine or something. And he was telling me all stories about the 80s Olympics. And I'm like, Bob, I wasn't even born yet, man. Like, I know some stuff. I don't know everything, man. <laughs> have you seen – boy, maybe I shouldn't bring this up. I don't want to offend anybody. But have you seen these uh, – I guess they're memes or they're uh, – they're fake like exchanges, I think, between he and Ron Darling, where, you know, Bob goes off on some some like big picture, you know, really deep thing. And then the the response is always, I think he's gonna throw him a slider. Yeah. <laughs> that was during the playoffs. That was during the playoffs, because they were group and then yeah. me and Brian Anderson did the other one. Yeah. Uh, final two questions. What's your most memorable broadcast moment? Um Mm. I know when I get off this, I'm going to think of another one, but I think one that sort of changed the trajectory of my career was I was doing Sports Center the night of the Olympic bombing. And honestly, compels me to say that my pride doesn't like to. I think there were some doubts about what I could handle and what I couldn't, you know, among management at ESPN. And we were on for 10 hours consecutively after that with, you know, no real knowledge of what was going on, just having to have things fed to you and the moment and try to relay them, interview people as they come up, hopefully uh, prepared for life as it were. So I think probably in terms of the the most meaningful and the thing that really helped the trajectory of my career, uh, that would, that would probably, that would probably be right up there. Wow. Powerful. Well, I'll tell you what, man, we can't thank you enough. We're going to have one final question for you. Uh, I would love for you to g- just give your best advice to youth sports parents and these young athletes as they navigate their journey. One final thing for them. Being competitive is okay. Teach your kid the value of winning, but not at all cost, and let them have fun. Uh, teach them that, those aren't mutually exclusive things that you should try to achieve. You should try to compete and that's okay. That that's part of the fun. That part of the fun is competing, but don't get mad or angry or frustrated or feel anxiety over their performances at a young age and always be there for them. And basically get them next time. I guess, you know, I I told you my dad always said, stay cool. Um, Sometimes after games, he would also say, uh, win a few, lose a few, some get rained out. So maybe, you know, maybe if you, if you think about that in that context, it can, it can help. Man. Well, 
thank you for joining us. I know it was your off week, man, which worked out great for us, uh, but it meant a lot for you to come on. We're huge fans. and Definitely. Thanks so much, Reese. Yeah, yeah. Great. thanks, and great thanks great for all you do for college sports because uh, three huge college football and college basketball fans, and you are part of that. Uh, you're part of our memories for the past 30 years of, of watching just great, great memories, and thank you for all you do. Well, thank you for having me on, guys. I really, really appreciate it, and uh, good luck with everything. Hope this uh, keeps thriving as it is so far. Hey, guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for checking out Pure Athlete, and subscribe to our channel on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you go to listen to our podcast. Right.